FIFA World Cup final, France versus Brazil. Vive la football. France v Brazil. Should have been Brazil v Jamaica. If only. Never mind. As they say in Jamaica, not never done before the time. Which roughly translated means that nothing ever happens before it is due to happen. How true is that? The finale to a month for football. We wouldn't see the likes of this again, well, at least for another four years. So the journey, one last journey had to be made. For those who hadn't managed to stay over in France throughout the whole of the time, between Japan versus Jamaica and the World Cup final. Everybody knew it wasn't feasible to think about tickets for this one. Even the touts, mostly French, held tightly onto their tickets. After all, this was the final organisers had dreamt about. This match was every France 98 marketing man's dream final, the world champions against the host nation, France. You may recall that, though France is regarded as the cuisine capital of Europe, at the earlier Grand Games, Jamaican fans had brought their own food with them. Rice and peas with chicken, Akian saltfish with fried dumpling, jerk pork, Slasibon, white rum and red stripe. By the time of the final, familiarity with France and the cosmopolitan nature of the French capital meant that the fans were no longer having to carry food with them to get a flavour that suited their tastes. French Caribbean restaurants in Paris had been welcoming oases during the build-up to the Argentina game. Havens for the hungry and thirsty attending the second round matches involving Brazil and Nigeria and were now essential stop-off points. Paris was as atmospheric a city as you will ever experience on the day of the final. The smell of coffee from the sidewalk cafe, the noise of people in their cars, beeping their horns and revving their engines, red, blue and white scarves and ribbons flying from car aerials and sunroofs, flags blowing from apartment windows in the Parisian breeze, it seemed as though everyone in Paris had a smile on their face that day. There were television sets everywhere, in the cafes, restaurants, department and jewellery stores, clothes shops, even the street vendors, and newspaper stands were bearing the latest World Cup news. The French had built a luxurious showpiece stadium, the Stade de France, otherwise known as Paris Saint-Denis, an arena with a crowd capacity of 105,000 for the climax to what had been one of the most friendly World Cups ever. Outside the stadium, there was chaos. Friendly, warm, happy chaos. It was as though suddenly, and almost unexpectedly, those making their way to the stadium had hit a wall of sound, and people, people as far as the eye could see, and every one of them, it seemed, happy or laughing. People wearing French shirts, Brazilian shirts, German shirts, Croatian shirts, Argentinian shirts, Dutch shirts, Jamaican shirts. Colour and sound was everywhere. One Brazilian fan entering the ground had a spare ticket which he sold outside the stadium to a man wearing a Jamaican shirt. The Jamaican supporter was heard bartering with the Brazilian over the price of the ticket and, after he'd bought it, he asked the man in the yellow shirt with a famed number 10 on his back how it was that he actually had a spare ticket for the World Cup final. The Brazilian replied that he bought the ticket for his wife as a surprise, but that she'd died. The Jamaican offered his condolences, and then curiosity seemed to get the better of him, as he was heard to ask the Brazilian, now busy counting a wad of French franc notes, how it was that he hadn't sold the ticket to one of his friends in Brazil, seeing as this was the final and they were supposedly the most passionately patriotic soccer supporters on the planet. To which the Brazilian replied, I would have sold it to one of my friends, but they all wanted to go to the funeral. Not really a true story, but it gives you an idea of how important this match was to the fans of the teams in the final. Colour and sound was everywhere. Here was a spectacle to behold. Faces were being painted, the organisers having arranged for free face paints in team colours to be distributed amongst the crowds, as they had done at every World Cup match. A symphony of drum beats, car horns, whistles, fog horns, and brass bands hit the ears. Noise was everywhere, but joyous noise. Once again, the French laid on the hospitality, and once again, the match was shown free of charge, within earshot of the Stade de France, open air on large video screens. 
Yet again, there was no segregation. How could there be when this had turned into such an amazingly cosmopolitan gathering? Brazilians sat by side with the French, side by side with too many nationalities to mention. People reminisced with foreign strangers about World Cup's past and fantasised about the coming final. A Brazilian fan sitting near the main Jamaican entourage explained that the whole of Brazil had been thoroughly embarrassed at the team's performance in the boring finale of USA 94. Despite the fact that Brazil had won, one of the Jamaican fans, so sharp he nearly cut himself with his own tongue, intent it seemed on playing at his own version of the World Cup final, responded, the only people who played well in the 94 final were the band at half-time. So obviously when it came to banter, it's Jamaica won, Brazil nil. So then one of the Brazilian supporters, who overheard the comment and the result in giggles, slightly miffed at the cheek of a World Cup novice fan, laughingly replied that in Brazil they were thinking of naming a new bra for the skinnier woman, Jamaica. And when he was asked why, he responded, plenty of support, my friend, but no cups. So now it's Jamaica won, Brazil won. Outnumbered and flanked on all sides by Brazilians, it was quickly decided that perhaps it would be best to call this particular match quits, whilst it remained a good-humoured draw. A woman, sporting a Carmen Miranda-style fruit basket hat, danced nearby to the drums and trumpets sounding off the screen. Blue shirts with the name Zidane etched across the back, yellow shirts with the names Ronaldo and Denilson stenciled onto them, joined in the merrymaking in some kind of crazy pre-mapped samba. The smell of hot food being sold from stalls surrounding the screening area wafted by as people of every conceivable race sang and talked against a background of chanting from the nearby stadium. The French fans, though happy that their team had at last reached the final of France 98, were not confident that their captain, Didier Deschamps, would be holding the trophy aloft at the end of the match. After all, only a year earlier at Le Tournoi, a friendly tournament arranged as a warm-up for the World Cup to test French organisational skills, France had taken an absolute hammering from the Brazilians, Roberto Carlos scoring from a free kick that curled so much the ball appeared to defy the laws of physics on its way past the floundering French keeper. As the whistle blew, signalling the start of the match, little did those doubters know that one of the greatest upsets of World Cup history was about to unfold before their eager eyes. The samba salsa beat of South American drums pounded away relentlessly the trumpeters accompanying expertly, but for once on the field of play. The feet of the Brazilian maestros seemed to be dancing to the wrong tune. When Zidane scored that first French goal, for a moment, a split second, there was disbelief even amongst those raving the tricula, the flag of the host nation. A second later, that disbelief exploded into a frenzy of tumultuous uproar as the French fans gregariously shouted, jumped, danced, hugged and kissed anybody and anything they could grab a hold of. The Brazilians in the crowd were distraught and those Jamaicans and others who had come to lend their support to their Brazilian cousins, amazed. This was a scene that was to be reenacted twice more during the match. As Zidane repeated his scoring feat with Petit rounding the game off in style. The French captain, Didier Deschamps, held the trophy aloft at the end of the match to the rapturous cheers of the nation. The strange thing, though, was that the Brazilian fans, although disappointed that their team had lost in the final, applauded the French celebrations. It was almost as if they were stating, by their applause, that the Golden Globe trophy was only on loan for the next four years. Indeed, the majority of Brazilians, it seemed, joined in the multinational mother of all street parties with a salsa band struck up on a stage outside the stadium. Car horns blared and the night was thick with smoke from the fireworks exploding above the heads of the crowds and lighting up the smoky black night sky as the champagne that the French are so famous for flowed freely into the early hours of the morning. Somebody, maybe the Brazilians, maybe the Jamaicans, had taught the French how to carnival. And as the party that was to leave the whole of France with a morning after hangover to end all hangovers raved on, it was obvious that, Although it wasn't Jamaican hands that lifted the famous trophy at the end of the competition, the Jamaican fans had left their own indelible, unmistakable fingerprints on the World Cup finals. 
France had been caught up in the international party that is the coup de mort. And though the day following the victory night party was at first subdued, the opportunity to be patriotic and glory in being world champions was not going to pass the French by. The hangover of the night before had gone by the following afternoon, and from now on the festivities would take on a distinctly garlic flavour. Their job as host done, this was a celebration for the French at the end of a tournament that had been as successful an exercise in selling their nation to the world as anyone could ever have hoped for. A plethora of nations had come to France 98 and had drunk from the World Cup, quenching their thirst for international soccer. Now it was the turn of the French to quench their thirst and moisten throats that had become hoarse from cheering. The Champs-Élysées was the chosen route for the triumphant team to display the trophy, won so convincingly against the Brazilians. Double-decker coaches, with photographic portraits of their sporting heroes emblazoned across them, drove down the city's central thoroughfare, with people cheering at the photographs. If they were cheering photographs, then you can imagine the joyous clamour they made when their heroes actually appeared and paraded the Golden Globe that is the World Cup before an ecstatically grateful nation. Amongst the multitude of old Jamaican sayings, there is one that tells us, every exit is for an entrance to somewhere else. For the fans in the black, gold and green, the supporters of the Jamaican national football team, the end of France 98, their first World Cup finals goal by Robbie Earl, the victory against Japan that earned Jamaica three points, and the end of this book are exactly that, an entrance to somewhere else. The road to France 98 and the three points earned in that victory against Japan were only the beginning of a journey for the reggae men's. Jamaica moved from outside the top 100 teams in FIFA's world rankings to a current position of 27th and also became the first English-speaking Caribbean team ever to reach the World Cup finals, finishing a respectable 22nd of the 32 teams.